Hello everyone, my name is Madhubani Singh. Let me begin this video with a question. As per your knowledge, which is the largest derivative market in the world? I'll repeat the question. As per your knowledge, which is the largest derivative market in the world? Type your answers in the comments below. Actually, I'll make it a little easy for you. I'll give you three options. Is it the US, Hong Kong or India? In my last video, I spoke about two derivative instruments, namely forwards and futures. Continuing that, in this video, I will tell you about another derivative instrument called options. I will tell you about the types of options called call and put with the help of an example. Classification of options called moneyness of options is also something that I will be talking to you about. And at the end of the video, as a bonus, I will share with you some very interesting facts about the derivative market in India. So let's begin with what are options. An options contract is a standardized derivative instrument where the buyer of the contract has the right to buy or not buy or sell or not sell the underlying asset at the agreed price at the time of expiry of the contract. The underlier could be a stock or an index. And just like the futures contracts, option contracts are also issued by the exchange as a source of revenue for them. And just like other derivative instruments, options are also used for hedging and speculation purposes. Now, before I go ahead with the types of options contracts, let me familiarize you with some terms that are used in options contracts. The first one is spot price. This is the current price at which the underlier is trading in the spot market. The next is strike price. This is the price of the underlier that is agreed upon by the buyer and the seller at the time of entering into the agreement. It is like an anchor price around which the entire trade is based. The next term is called exercise. What that means is that at the time of expiry of the contract, if the buyer decides to claim his right of buying or selling the underlying asset, it is known as exercising an options contract. Another term used is called expiry, which basically means the date on which the contract comes to an end. Depending upon the underlying asset, the expiry date could be on a weekly basis on a Thursday or once a month on the last Thursday of every month. Last and the most important one is called premium. This is the amount that the option buyer pays to the option seller for the right to exercise the options contract, which is to buy or sell the underlying asset at the time of expiry. It comprises of two things, intrinsic value and time value. Intrinsic value is the amount that the options buyer is entitled to if he were to exercise his option. It is basically the difference between the spot price and the strike price. Time value is a slightly technical concept, but in short, simple words, it is the amount that the option buyer pays to the seller for the duration of the contract. Now, the longer the time to expiry, the higher will be the time value. When I explain all these terms with the example in just a few moments, it will make more sense. So let's talk about the types of options contracts. Now, if you're learning about this for the first time, here's a heads up. It can get a little overwhelming. I'll try and explain it in as simple words as possible, but I highly recommend watching this part of the video again. So the two types of options contracts are call and put. Let's first discuss about buying a call option. I'll explain this with the hypothetical scenario. Apples available in the market are from cold storage, which is expensive due to the additional storage cost involved. In three weeks, fresh apples will be harvested and made available for sale. Due to a favorable weather this year, the apple supply will be in abundance. Hence, the price for the consumer will be on the lower side. But there is a transportation strike going on 
and if the issues are not resolved soon, it may affect the price of fresh apples in the market. Now let's say Ramesh wants to buy 500 kgs of apples and is willing to pay a maximum rate of rupees 100 per kg. Now due to the good harvest, apples are expected to be sold at the rate of rupees 80 per kg. But due to the transportation strike, there is a chance that the apples may cost upwards of rupees 110 per kg. So buyer Ramesh approaches seller Prakash and enters into an agreement wherein Ramesh pays a premium amount of rupees 1000 to Prakash on May 1st. As per the terms of the agreement, at the time of expiry of the agreement, that is on May 25th, Ramesh will decide if he wishes to buy the apples or not. By paying this premium, Ramesh buys the right to decide at a later date if he wishes to buy the apples or not. Now on May 25th, Let's say the rate is rupees 90 per kg. Ramesh decides to exercise his right to buy the apples. Ramesh will make a profit of rupees 10 per kg or a total profit of rupees 5000. If the rate is the same as the strike rate, that is rupees 100, he may or may not exercise his right to buy. And if the rate is more than rupees 100, he can simply decline to buy the apples as he would end up incurring a loss if he went ahead with the purchase. His loss will be limited to rupees 1000 he has paid as a premium. This way, he has hedged his risk of rate exceeding his buying capacity and limits his loss. Now you may ask how Prakash benefits from this agreement. Well, for starters, Prakash gets to keep the premium amount of rupees 1000 regardless of Ramesh's decision to buy or not buy. Since the agreement is entered into in advance before the apples even arrive in the market, even if Ramesh does not buy them, Prakash can find other buyers in the spot market. Now let's apply the same logic to the financial market. Let's say the underlier is Nifty 50 index, spot price is Rs 18,000, Ramesh expects the market to go up to Rs 18,200 which is his strike price. So he buys an option contract on May 1st with a lot size of 50. The expiry date of his contract is May 25th and he pays a premium of rupees 7,500 for the same. Now let's consider the three possible scenarios on May 25th. The first, if the spot price is rupees 18,250, Ramesh exercises his right to buy the underlier he will make a profit which is equal to the spot price minus the strike price, that is 18,250 minus 18,200, which is equal to rupees 50 per unit or rupees 2,500 for the entire lot. The second scenario, if the spot price is rupees 18,200, Ramesh stands to make no profit or loss as the spot price minus strike price will be equal to zero. He may or may not choose to exercise his right to buy. The third scenario is if the spot price is rupees 18,150. Here Ramesh will be making a loss of rupees 50 per unit and a total loss of rupees 2,500. So he will not exercise the right to buy. The whole idea of the trade is to make a profit, right? So a call options contract is when we buy the options contract, pay a premium to the seller for the right to be able to decide at a future date if we wish to buy or not buy the underlying asset at the time of expiry. This is also known as a long call option. Now some of the key features of a long call option are that the buyer has the right to decide if he wishes to buy the underlying asset or not. The seller is obligated to do as the buyer wishes. The buyer must be bullish about the market and the seller must be bearish. Now the loss of the buyer is limited to the premium paid, whereas the profit can be unlimited as long as the strike price is less than the spot price. The break-even point for the buyer, which is the 
point where he makes no profit or loss is equal to the strike price plus premium. Any amount below this break-even point, the buyer will be incurring a loss. So let's look at the same scenario from the seller's side. The seller of an options contract is known as a writer. And a writer must oblige by the wish of the buyer of the contract as he has received a premium amount for the same. As I explained in the hypothetical scenario, the benefits available for the seller, he gets to keep the premium amount regardless of the buyer's decision to buy or not buy the underlying asset. Now the seller is bearish about the market and benefits if the spot price goes down. Although the profit of the seller is limited to the premium received, the loss can be unlimited if the market goes in the opposite direction. From the writer's point of view, this call option is known as a short call. The breakdown point of a writer is equal to the strike price plus the premium received. Any amount above that and the seller or the writer will be incurring a loss. Now the break even point for the seller is equal to the break down point of the writer. Another thing to note over here is that the writer is required to maintain a margin with the exchange. This is done to ensure that there is no default from the seller's side. So this was about buying and selling of call option or long call and short call. If you understood call option, it will be very easy to, for you to follow through the next option type. Now let me tell you about the put option. So a put option contract is when the buyer of the contract buys the right to decide at a later date if he wishes to sell or not sell the underlying asset at an agreed price. Here the buyer of the contract is bearish about the market and expects the markets to decline. Let's go back to our example of, with Nifty 50 index as the underlier. The spot price is rupees 18,000 and the lot size is 50. This time Ramesh is bearish about the market and enters into a put option with a strike price of rupees 17,800. This means that at the time of expiry of the contract, Ramesh has bought the right to decide whether or not he wishes to sell the underlier. Now there are three possible outcomes. The first one is that the spot price declined to rupees 17,700. If Ramesh chooses to exercise his right to sell, he will make a profit as he gets to sell at a higher price. In this case, his profit will be equal to 100 rupees into 50 units equal to rupees 5000. The second case is where the spot price is rupees 17,800. Ramesh may or may not exercise his right to sell as at this spot price, he will neither make a profit nor incur a loss. The last case is where the market goes in the opposite direction and the spot price rises to rupees 18,100. In this case, Ramesh will incur a loss that is equal to 17,800 minus 18,100, that is rupees 300 into 50 units equal to rupees 15,000. It makes no sense to exercise the right to sell the underlier here. When we buy the right to sell or not sell an underlying asset, it is known as a long put option. And the buyer of a put option benefits from being bearish about the market. The loss in a put option or a long put option is restricted to the premium paid and the profits can be unlimited as long as the spot price is less than the strike price. The break-even point for the buyer is equal to strike price minus the premium paid. This is when he makes no profit or loss. Now let's consider the seller's perspective of a put option. The writer of a put option contract must oblige with the buyer 
and buy the underlying asset at the agreed price if the buyer decides to sell the same. The writer would benefit if the market is bullish, that is the spot price is higher than the strike price. In that case, the buyer of the contract might not sell the underlying asset. This type of option is known as a short put option. The seller of the short put option contract receives a premium and the profit is also restricted to the premium amount received. The loss, however, can be exponential if the spot price is lower than the strike price and the seller of the contract has to buy the underlying asset at a higher rate. The breakdown point of the writer of the short put option is equal to the difference between the strike price and the premium received. Any amount beyond that and the writer would have to incur a loss. And just like the writer of a short call option, the writer of a short put option also has to maintain a margin with the exchange so as to reduce the risk of default. Now to summarize all the four option types, let's take a look at it in a form of a graph. The X axis is the spot price and the Y axis is the premium paid. It shows the risk and reward that the buyer and seller stand to make. The risk is in the form of premium paid and a reward when the strike price goes above or below the spot price. The long call and short call are mirror images and so are short put and long put. The graph also shows the buyer's break even point and the seller's breakdown point of no profit, no loss. I hope you were able to follow through the information that I shared about option types. I highly recommend watching this video again for better clarity. Now moving on to classification of option types. The four option types are classified based on how much money the buyer and the seller stand to make or lose in the trade. It helps the trader to decide which strike to trade. That is why it is called moneyness of the option contract. The three classes are in the money or ITM, at the money or ATM, and out of the money or OTM. Before I go ahead with explaining these classes, I hope you remember the term intrinsic value that I explained at the beginning of this video. Intrinsic value is the amount that the option buyer is entitled to if he or she were to exercise his option contract at expiry. It is the difference between the spot price and the strike price. It is this intrinsic value that decides how much money will the buyer or seller make or lose and decide the moneyness of the option contract. Call option intrinsic value or IV is equal to spot price minus strike price. IV can never be a negative number as that would mean that the buyer is paying out of pocket but we know that the buyer's loss is limited to the premium paid. So any negative value is considered to be zero. Now for call options, if IV is greater than zero, that is the spot price is higher than the strike price, then it would be in the money or ITM. If IV is equal to zero, that is the spot price is equal to strike price, it means that the strike is at the money or ATM. If IV is less than zero, it means that the strike price is greater than the spot price and the strike would be out of the money or OTM. For example, let's consider the Nifty 50 index as an underlier again. Spot price is rupees 18,000. Strike price for the call option is rupees 18,200. If the spot price is rupees 18,225, IV will be rupees 25, which means that the strike is ITM. If the spot price is rupees 18,000, IV will be zero, hence ATM. And if the spot price is rupees 17,900, IV will again be zero because IV cannot be a negative number and this strike will be OTM. 
The amount of premium that the buyer pays decreases from an ITM to an OTM strike. Let's move on to the put option. A put option IV is equal to strike price minus spot price. If IV is greater than zero, that means that the strike price is higher than the spot price. Hence, this would be a ITM. If IV is equal to zero, it would be an ATM. If IV is less than zero, it means that the spot price is higher than the strike price. And this would be a OTM. Let's go back to our Nifty 50 underlier example. Spot price of rupees 18,000. Strike price for the put option is rupees 17,800. If the spot price is rupees 17,700, IV will be rupees 100, which means that the strike is ITM. If the spot price is rupees 17,800, IV will be zero, hence ATM. And if the spot price is rupees 17,900, IV will again be zero because IV cannot be a negative number and the strike will be OTM. The different classes have a different premium amount for the same underlier. This way we can see where the buyer and seller of the options contract will make or lose money and can decide on which strike to trade. This brings us to the end of the basic information about options as a derivative instrument. At the beginning of this video, I asked you a question, which is the largest derivative market in the world? Well, you will be surprised to know that in terms of the volume of contracts, India's national stock exchange is the largest derivative market in the world. For your reference, as per report from NSC, in the year 2022-23, the total number of options contracts was more than 4100 crore for a value of more than rupees 100 crores. You can see the data for US and Hong Kong markets for comparison. I hope you found this video helpful in understanding options contracts. If I missed out on any information, do let me know. Please share your views in the comments below and share this video with your friends if you think that they can also learn something from it. Thank you and have a great day.